the secrets of Pentecost. How many here know a tremendous about, tremendous a lot about Pentecost? Good, no hands, that's what I thought. And some things are hidden, but to be revealed in scripture. So Pentecost, see, I'd like to know what it is. Pentecost, for, for many Christians in the New Testament, is the day in which the Holy Spirit came into the earth in a new and fresh way. It's when the church was born on the day of Pentecost. It's when the kingdom came. Remember in the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Father, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. The kingdom came at the day of Pentecost. Everyone say kingdom. kingdom. Is where a king dwells and where his subjects are safe. Amen. If you love Jesus, then you're a subject of the kingdom of heaven. Can you say amen? And so we're going to be studying about the, the word Pentecost, what it is. It's mentioned in the scripture. It is a series of seven weeks with the 50th day being the day of Pentecost. So Pentecost actually lasted from a day after Passover all the way through, right on up, okay, to Pentecost. 49 days, the 50th being the fullness of the day coming. Can you say amen? All right, so I said all that to get you to go on, on this. Number one, I want to give this to you. The Greek word for Pentecost means 50th. Doesn't mean 50. It means the 50th of 50 days, the last of the 50. So everyone say 50th. Yeah. Remember when you were 50? <laughs> Way back before there were cars, Amen. Amen. So it means 50th. Now, what's so exciting about it is during the first Pentecost, some wonderful things happened, not quite what the Israelites were expecting. And then the last Pentecost that you and I have to deal with is the Pentecost in the book of Acts chapter 2. And so let's give you another thing. Pentecost starts on the day after Passover, goes 49 days, and on the 50th day is the day of Pentecost. Say amen, somebody. Jesus rose from the dead. He's what we call the first fruits. Pentecost is another name for Pentecost is first fruits or a wave offering. A wave offering. Jesus waved and said, Father, it's all clear. Those that accept me get born again, and you will favor them. A wave offering. Can you say amen? I like to do it. Wave offering. You know, give me a big hand, you know, a round of a... No, just go. <laughs> it's, it's all right to have fun with you, isn't it? All right, so let's go ahead and teach you a little more, okay? So, 49 days after the... Uh, 49 days later, after Jesus rose again from the dead, on the 50th day, that was the day of Pentecost. It had fully come. When Pentecost come again, let me tell you, the Holy Spirit, you need to know this, entered the earth like never before. So let me explain. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was in the earth, but very limited. Can anybody tell me why? Because the prince of this world had a blockage, blocking God from intervening with humans all the way through the Old Testament. And it wasn't until a human being made a covenant with God, said, God, I need your help, then God would make a covenant with him. Amen. So the Holy Spirit was very limited in the Old Testament. In fact, you had to find a priest if you wanted your sins to be forgiven. You had to find a prophet if you had to hear the word of the Lord. And many times in the Old Testament, it says the vision and the light of the Lord was dim. People didn't have an understanding of God like you and I can have an understanding of God in the New Testament. Can you say amen? Now, I'm not poo-poo in the Old Testament. I'm just trying to tell you what happened at Pentecost, how God's bringing in a harvest. Now, let me, let me see the hands of those who have ever heard this term. Former and latter rain. How many's ever heard that term? The former rain is the day of Pentecost. 
And the farmer rain would come to prepare the ground so they could break it up and pull out the weeds and plant the seeds for harvest. Can you say amen? You see, the day of Pentecost, God sent the rain. He set the kingdom. He sent his power. Jesus rose from the dead and then gave you an equipment kingdom that you've got to find out what it is. You can't play church and stay ignorant and, and grow in the Lord the way he wants you to. God wants us to grow. Can you say amen? So the beginning of the outpouring at Pentecost was called the former rain. And all the way through up until we know it's called the rapture, just before the rapture comes will be a giant outpouring called the latter rain. Everyone say latter rain. And the latter rain is always greater then the former rain. The former rain gets the, the ground ready as they till it, but then as everything grows, the latter rains come to prepare for the harvest and to mature the fruit. Now, we're not talking about plants necessarily here. We're talking about you. When you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that was your former rain. And as you walk with him, praise God, you continue to walk with him. God one day is going to blow that trumpet and is going to catch us away. And God will finish the latter rain and you will be harvested. Can you say amen? Boy, Pastor Kerry, that sounds like a, a real crop. <laughs> yeah, the angels are the harvesters. Do you ever read the end of the day? The angels are sent forth to harvest people. To get people who are ready for his coming. <clears throat> say amen. amen so when Pentecost came for a New Testament believer the church was born 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ on that 50th Pentecostal day God filled the earth with his glory now remember we were talking about the Old Testament God's spirit was very limited that's why it seemed like the devil was running rampant in the Old Testament but in the New Testament, who came? Who died? Who rose again from the dead? Who kicked the booty of the devil? Amen. And then he says, I have that victory. You have that victory in me. Now you've got to declare what I did when I said it is finished. So Pentecost not only caused the church to be born, but he equipped us with a kingdom. Everyone say kingdom. It means dominion, power, and influence. That's what kingdom means in every Old and New Testament scripture. Kingdom means dominion, power, and influence. Thy dominion and power and influence come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are you with me? Amen. There are two kingdoms in the Bible. Let's leave the devils out. Can you say, <laughs> what do you mean two kingdoms, Pastor Gary? Well, how many know in the beginning God? There wasn't any fallen devil. Can you say amen? There wasn't any sin in the beginning. It all was God. Can you say amen? That's called the kingdom or the dominion, power, and influence of God. Nothing had broke off. No devil became fallen yet. Okay? Then we see that Lucifer decided he wanted to keep this planet and declare that he was going to be greater than God and he was going to ascend up in the most high. And God says, oh, no, you're not. Well, boom, threw him back down upon the planet. And the planet wretched in turn. You'll find that in Psalms 82. But when he threw him back down on the planet, the planet became a fallen planet. Let me ask you something. Is God perfect? Yes. Is he? Has he ever made a mistake? You sure about that? Yes. Of course, he has never made a mistake, and he's perfect. So when he created this planet, how did he create it? Perfect. perfect. So how come we see in there it says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. What in the world happened? God doesn't make things that way. That's when you got to understand that Satan was on this planet for God. He was working this planet for God. So God one day would take his 
creature called man, made in his image after his likeness, the crown of all of his creation, not that we should be proud about that, but he made us that way. We didn't make ourselves. And he put us in here, and Satan was very jealous. And he says, I thought I was your second in command. And yet we see through the scripture that God made man second in command. And Satan says, I'll fix that. And we have the story, the fall of man. Can you say amen? So when man fell, he turned the planet over to the devil, and the devil took charge and booted God off of this planet. Did you know that? He booted God off of this planet. In fact, in the temptations of Christ, when, when, when Satan said to Jesus, all of these kingdoms all delivered to you because they were delivered unto me from Adam. Remember, God gave all the works of his hands over to Adam, but Adam committed high treason and fell. So who did he give those plans to? Satan. Now God was outside looking in. What does God need in your life to get into your life? An invitation. So you'll find out through the whole entire Old Testament, God had to find people who wanted him and wanted to give invitation. And God worked with each person all the way down through the lines and the bloodlines. And for those of you listening want to know, why does men, why are men picked out more than women? Because men carry the bloodline. And it's all about the bloodline for the birth of Christ. Can you say amen? God is not throwing women out. Who was the first person to the tomb? Two women. And it was empty. Are you with me? So what you need to understand is Pentecost was a plan of God. And it started because of God's compassion all the way into the beginning, dealing with the Israelites in bondage to Egypt. So are you with me still? Let's go. Go with me to Exodus chapter 23. The first Pentecost. Remember, Pentecost is a, a series of celebrations for seven weeks, 49 days. And then on the 50th day, Pentecost. Let me explain this. For 49 days or seven weeks, the harvest is being prepared. Can you say amen? The fields are being plowed, the crops are being matured, and then they were to gather them all up, and then they would bring them in to the house of the Lord. It's called an ingathering. And then they were to have a holy convocation. Everyone say convocation. It means gathering. Then they were to gather unto the Lord and offer the Lord the wave offering. Amen? All a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. So, here's the scenario. I find this very, very almost sad but humorous. Okay, what did God do with the Israelites? He protected them in Egypt, but then when Egypt started oppressing the Israelites, God sent Moses, didn't he? Remember, whenever you're having problems, don't panic. God will send you a Moses, or he'll send you an answer. The idea is don't panic and get into yourself because you'll continue to hinder the answer from coming. Say, oh me. All right. So when they left Egypt, how did the Israelites leave Egypt? Quickly. And with all the Egyptians' treasures. Their pockets were loaded with gold and silver. Their shoes wouldn't wear out. Their clothing wouldn't wear out. Can you say amen? They left in haste. And they ate the bitter foods to remind them that Egypt was not so hot. I know some of you got bitter memories you want to choose to forget. Say amen. And when they left, they left Egypt in a hurry. They left as champions, so they got a big head. How would you like similarly out of the blue, God starts handing you all kinds of sense. Now get up, leave. I got great plans for you. Wouldn't you get a big head? Well, there'd be a tendency to get a big head up. So we go all the way up to Exodus 19. Now, we're, I told you to go to Exodus 23, right? We went to Exodus 19. What's going on, Pastor Kerry? Well, there's a journey from e leaving Egypt for 49 days. And on the 50th is when Moses is going to go up and get what? 
Boy, you Bible scholars. The 10 suggestions, oh, commandments. Here's what was going on, so you know it. The Israelites had sort of a big head. Now, I'm not putting them down, please. I love those people. All of us can get a big head if we live in the flesh. Then you get terribly disappointed when it doesn't go your way. And they came to Moses and they said to Moses, I'm going to talk to you like you're Moses. Moses, our God has made us be able to be blessed. So Moses, when you go up there and you talk to God, you tell him we can do anything he asks us to. Now here's what I believe. I believe God's original plan was to give the Israelites instructions to get across the desert and into the promised land with very little problems. That's our God, isn't it? But we see that they got all kinds of problems. It took 11 day journey, it took them 40 years. I'd say they had a whole lot of problems. And if you read about it, first Corinthians, you know, chapter 10, first Corinthians 10, read about it, how God was not happy with them. And they wandered around complaining and all that, but it took them 49 days just to get to Sinai. Now, here's something that I bring up to you just for fun. They complained when the waters got bitter. They didn't like this and they didn't like that. I kept complaining to Moses. Now, did God do anything against them? Not a thing. He just let them complain, let them do all. He needed to get them right to Mount Sinai because something was going to happen at that Pentecost. Something that would open their eyes, something that would tell them something they really, really need to know. So they came up to Moses, you just, when you go up there, you tell God we're his people. Does God like pride? Can you tell me why? Satan had pride. And what did God do with him? If you want to try this, I do not recommend it. Get a little prideful sometime and see how your day goes, monkey. He'll just slam you right down. Because pride cometh before destruction, the haughty spirit before. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Hello? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. So our job is to get down with God, and he will lift us up with him. Can you say amen? If your job is to exalt yourself, then you're going to get down all right, but it won't be very, very happily. You'll be rubbing your knees and thinking about yourself and you're terrible and all that kind of stuff. That's just normal. What happens when people walk in the flesh? Say, not me. Look at somebody else and say, you're not in the flesh, are you? <laughs> of course you're not. Can you laugh with me? Smile up here. Preachers aren't made to drill on you. We're made to show you things. Can you say amen? Now, I always found something. My pastor used to say, son, never put something on or take something personal if the shoe don't fit. If the preacher's describing something that sounds pretty normal that needs to be straightened up, please don't get under guilt because that might be describing you. That is not the way you hear the Word of God. The Word of God gives you hope, builds your faith, gives you comfort, and exhorts you to change. Say amen. I don't know if I can say that again. Okay, let's go on. Look at this. Exodus 23, verse 14. Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. So three times we're seeing Pentecost, okay? You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread, and you shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you. And on the, the time appointed in the north of, excuse me, in the month of Abib, for in you came out, for excuse me, for in it you came out of Egypt, none shall appear before you, okay, as empty, you'll have plenty of stuff. And the feast of the harvest, this is Pentecost, and the feast of the harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field, 49 days, seven weeks, and the feast of the ingathering, when you bring it all into the barn, at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. So that's what Pentecost is. There's a whole bunch more describes them. So think about it. Who was the first person planted for our freedom? Jesus. Jesus was like a seed and he was planted in death. 
And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And those that put their faith in him, we rise up with him. Can you say amen? And he is the beginning of the former reign. And as we walk through with him through our life, we'll come to our end of our life or be the latter rain, or maybe the rapture. Can you say amen? I don't know. I have several people that I know that they're up in their 90s, and they say, God told me I'm going to get a rapture before I go. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, maybe. That'd be great. I'm, I'm doubting. I don't want to doubt their faith. Can you say amen? Are you with me? So say, I understand. Pentecost was a celebration of what was to come. Jesus. Okay, so let's look at this, all right? So the Israelites came to Moses, says, hey, Moses, you tell God we can do everything. So Moses went up there, and I believe, Moses believed that he was going to go up there and get instructions for the Israelites. Can you say amen? What did Moses come down with? Not COVID. He came down with the Ten Commandments, didn't he? And what did he see them doing? They were worshiping. A golden calf. And God opened the ground, swallowed 3,000 of them. First day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got swallowed in the ground. Aren't you glad you're a New Testament? I'd hate to have Linda be walking in her yard. <laughs> what happened to mom? <laughs> We're in the New Testament. Can you say amen? We need to start really getting close to God because some of you only have a religious idea of God. We want to get you right in with God so you and God become buddies. If I can say that to you without offending you. God wants you so close that he can breathe his instruction to you no matter what's happening outside. You know his peace on the inside because you are close to him. Can you say amen? And so Moses went up there and much to his chagrin, came down with Ten Commandments looking down there and they're all worshiping that Kyle. I could hear God saying, see, I told you. People cannot save themselves. They cannot be good on their own. They need a God. And Satan took God from them. And now I want to give it back. And now I have to work the plan. Pentecost. So Moses came down and went back up for another 40 days. Come back down the second time and gave him the Ten Commandments. Can you say amen? And you know what they said? This is too hard for us. That's the whole thing. Number one, you cannot save yourself. You cannot be good because the moment you want to be real good, something shows up. Now, come on, don't look at me in that tone of voice. So what do you do? You meet with God, you pray, you take authority over your day, you walk with God so the enemy goes away. Hello? And you start being serious over your relationship with the Lord God. You want to get on fire? You become serious. God is looking for those that are sincere and respect him. Can you see? Man, he doesn't mind working the covenant out. So a couple of things. Number one, the Feast of Harvest was also called Pentecost. Seven weeks of celebration. They were to celebrate. Do you know why the Israelites had so many feasts? Actually, seven major ones, but there were more. Can you tell me why God gave them feasts to practice? I bet you you can't. Most of the people I ask, they can't even tell me, the Israelites. God gave the practice. Why do we have a wedding practice? We should have a wedding rehearsal. Right? We do have wedding rehearsals. All of those feasts, now please don't shoot me down here. You check it out yourself. All of those feasts were a rehearsal to the Israelites about the Messiah. Now there's seven major feasts, one of which is Pentecost, Passover, you know, trumpets, and all the other feasts that are there. All the first six deal with Jesus' coming the first time. How many know that Jesus came the first time already? Wave at me. Okay. So they're being reminded and they're doing feasts, even some of the well-meaning Christians waving flags and everything and not realizing the feast they're celebrating in is talking about Jesus when he comes the first time. They like they missed the boat. 
and all the zealousness and all that's going on, the only feast that deals with Jesus' second coming, you know it, it's the Feast of Trumpets. And the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words, he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Are you with me? So they went up. Moses came down and boy, they're in trouble. What did they find out? They found out they were special, but they've got a set of rules now that they can follow that they can't. What was the message? The law is simple. The law says you can't live up to what God expects. You're horribly lost. That's what the law says. So even when you do your best effort, now listen, I'm, there's a good news here. When you do your best effort and you do it for the law, you're going to feel condemned. Because who can be like God? Right. But see, God didn't leave it there. He says, look, you can't save yourself, so I'm going to send a Messiah. And he's going to come, and if you're humble enough and accept him into your heart, he will walk with you, and the Holy Spirit, another comforter will come, came at Pentecost, and he will guide you into all truth. He already sentenced the devil. The devil's already going to hell, and he's just got a little bit of time. So meanwhile, when he is going, getting ready to go to hell, don't listen to his lies. Hello, you have a shepherd to listen to, a voice of a stranger you will not follow. Hello? So, let's fast forward it all over to the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can someone say amen? amen. This purpose of Pentecost. So go with me to Acts chapter 1. You get anything out of this? How many here learned something new? Amen. So the first Pentecost, God really sealed the deal, didn't he? You better straighten up. <laughs> Remember the pride of the Israelites. Don't forget that. What were they doing when Jesus showed up? They were into all their own thing, weren't they? And when Jesus showed up, Jesus didn't fit in. Sherry, Jesus did not fit into the crowd. The religious people wanted to kill him. So don't call yourself religious, please. Religious people always want to kill the one that's happy and excited for God because it makes them look bad. So everyone put a smile on your face and say, God, help me. No. All right, so you with me? Acts chapter 1, look at verse 4. It says, and being assembled together, let's talk about the disciples, being assembled together with them, and Jesus being amongst them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, <clears throat> but to wait for the promise of the Father. Everyone say promise of the Father. Does God keep his promises? You find one of the promises of the Father in Joel chapter 2. In the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. That's why I'm dreaming, Scott. <laughs> Amen. But young people, you need to have vision. What that means is you need to have vision. What do you want to do for God? You want to have vision for what God wants done in you. Can you say amen? And the old men, they dream dreams. Why? They hope and they desire for things to come to pass. I was doing that this morning. I was saying, Lord, I dream in a dream that our broadcast will go forth in Jesus' name. And God says, didn't I tell you yesterday, just flip, flip the switch on? Peggy, weren't you told just flip the switch on? And when we listen to God and not try to interpret what he means, we'll flip the switch on and things will go. Now, if God comes to you and you're going through a little bit of a trial or, or something, don't panic. Get together with God and let him flip the switch on so you can see through his eyes. Can you say amen? Sometimes we can't see the answer because we're so focused on the problem. You don't want to focus on the problem. It offers no hope. You focus on Jesus, who is the answer to all our problems, and you worship in that time, and he gives you the wisdom that is from above. 
Can you say amen? I like his wisdom from above. It's first peaceable, and I like peace. How many has ever had other than peace? Did you enjoy it? No. We love peace. We walk with the Prince of Peace. Can you say amen? <laughs> All right, listen. And it says, in the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized or immerses you into water, but you shall be baptized or immersed into the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they come together, they asked him, saying, now this is what people want and what they're doing right now. And Jesus' answer is still the same. They came to him and they said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Remember the disciples believed that the Israelites are going to rule the world from Jerusalem. And it's true. Jesus is going to come to Jerusalem. He's a Jew. He's going to set up his throne at Jerusalem, and he's going to reign the world through you and I, through the Israelites, for a thousand years. And at the end, he's going to kick the booty of the devil and bind them all up. Can you say amen? And we won. Renovate this earth by fire and then remake it into the perfect thing that it was original that God had purposed and planned. Someone say amen. You're going to live forever, folks. Please don't camp this side of heaven. Don't put all your faith, all your hopes this side of heaven. Because then you're surely being set up because when something doesn't come to pass like you think it really should, then you could be disappointed. Listen, I get up every morning and say, whatever you want, God. Then when it shows up, I'm not disappointed. If nothing doesn't show up, God is. Can you see the difference? There's all a little bit, you know, I understand there's a little bit of selfishness we all have that God has to work out with us. Thank God he's working with us. Can you say amen? It's not going to leave you by yourself. That's dangerous. How many know if you leave a kid by themselves too long, mischief will happen? Why is that, Pastor Kerry? Because in the flesh, there's mischief. It says mischief's born in the heart of child, but only a rod of correction will drive it out. All right, let's go on. So it says, therefore, when they all came together, they asked him, say, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the fathers kept in his own power. What aren't we to know? You want to know what time? You're in the last days. But if you start pursue, pursuing that, getting into all of that, you're going to get off. Prophecy, New Testament prophecy, is not what you're hearing out there. You're, you're hearing people guessing what they think the scripture means. The only thing to correct scripture is scripture. Every major doctrine in the scripture has to have two or three other scriptures that say the same thing for it to be taught as a major teaching in the church. You can't grab a scripture out here and a scripture out there and then say, I'm the prophet of God. No, you're not. Anybody that calls himself something that God doesn't call himself is a liar. So don't run around calling yourself something special. You go around saying, I'm a humble servant of God, and I believe. And if I'm anything, God made me that way. See the wisdom in that? All right, let's move on. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times and the season where the Father kept in his own authority, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost came upon you. So there's something about this day of Pentecost that they're to go to Jerusalem and wait to be endued with power. The word endue is an old English word which means clothe with glistening power and light. So when he said, go to Jerusalem and wait, tell you and be endued with power from on high. Hello? Now let me ask you, Christian, how much power do you have in your life? Well, you have God. And for the Christian that's trying to release power on their own, stop it. Just release God. I've whispered, now I'm going to say, I have to use the word I. I was one of those guys that you would yell at the devil. I'd get angry at the devil. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And I, we go out. Now, we saw it a few weeks ago, the wonderful deliverance. But you didn't see me yell or anything, did you? 
But that's what I used to do. I, you know, we're taught, train, ah, I rebuke the devil. All I got was a hoarse voice. When you learn to bring God out of your spirit, and we teach that here, if you'll come more often, you release God out of your spirit, and God who comes out of your words does the work. Not you, not your screaming, not anything. Everyone say prayer. Okay, now look at me. Let's see if you can understand what I'm doing. My wife will get a kick out of this. What am I doing? I'm mentally thinking I'm praying. You don't mentally pray. Where's that in the scripture? You see how foolish Satan has chosen to pick on you? Most of your prayer, you, it's a silent prayer. No, folks. You believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. You believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. You believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. You don't believe in your heart and think with your brain. <laughs> Hold on. Let me send you another blessing, Sherry. Did you feel anything? We embrace things that are not true. We're operating on things that are not so, and we're missing the things that are. Say no more. Pray out loud. It doesn't have to. Father, in Jesus' name, you said, therefore I claim that it's done. Out loud. Words are covenant. That's why you don't look at your spouse and yell at them. Your words are power. So you just beat the tar out of your husband. <laughs> are you with me? I like to preach things where you could practice them daily. Okay, so Pentecost, back to Pentecost. So what came at Pentecost? Holy Spirit came. How did it come? It filled the whole house where they were at. We're going to read it here in a minute. It filled the whole atmosphere of the earth. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was only here by man's invitation. But in the New Testament, Jesus whipped the devil, rose again from the dead, sits at the right hand, gives us the Holy Spirit, and he says, learn to walk with him. But he's like a dove. Do not grieve him. But walk in agreement with the word with lots of positive praise. And he will order your steps. Can you say amen? In the New Testament, the Spirit of God is not limited here. Close your eyes for a minute. Let me paint this picture. How many ever remember hearing in the Old Testament the dew of Hammon? Of dew of Hammon coming down on the leaves and healing. How many? Anybody? Well, the dew. How many ever seen dew in the morning? It gets thick. We have some dew this morning. It gets on the lawn. It's all dewy, and you walk through here with your shoes, you know, right? Well, when the day of Pentecost came, God filled the atmosphere that you and I breathe with his anointed dew. You look at me, well, I sure he did. No, I, he did. And in fact, when you start lifting Jesus up in your heart, the dew starts to collect on you. And the more you keep acknowledging Jesus, the more you keep thanking the Lord, the more the dew collects on you. Hello? So if you want to do the do, then you should know what to do to get to do. Focus on Jesus. Keep your mouth shut on negative things because you can't change it. Start learning to praise the Lord and give things that you can't change over to God. Cast your care over on the Lord and begin to praise him. Then God's power begins to collect on you like dew. It rises up in you like new wine. It comes down on you like clothing. Let, let me ask you, after all that's happening, what in the world is the devil doing? He's freaked out because you're finding out what you have. You're finding out how it works. You're finding out you were given a kingdom that knows no defeat. There's no way Satan can even fight out that kingdom. So back to the kingdom. Everybody said, back to the kingdom. All right, so God has a kingdom. Satan was kicked out of it. And his one-third of his followers, let me tell you something new I just found out. 
Satan took one third of all the angels, but not all the angels in heaven. Only the one third were working with Satan. The other two thirds are still here working for God. Now the key is you can't see the angels. Now, has anybody here maybe caught a glimpse of possibly an angel? I had one come to my church someday. I'll tell you about it. Huh? Yeah, right? And singing over you. They're there. But see, folks, the reason why they're in an invisible realm is they're in a curtain. They're in a, a spiritual curtain that keeps them out of your sight, out of your physical sight. Now, when some, something happens, you call and you need help, God will allow one to come in and actually give you some gas or minister to you, like our case, came to church. And over almost 100 people saw them, saw this angel. And it was pretty amazing. And you'll say, well, how come? Here's the key. God wants you to believe in him. Say amen. And in order for you to see the kingdom of God the way it is, you have to believe that you can. That God will reveal to you what's in that kingdom. So say two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Okay, here's what happened. Lucifer fell onto this planet. God says, I need an invitation to get in there. And so he started getting invitations. But he still couldn't make a covenant strong enough to redeem man because mankind kept breaking the covenant. So he gave the law to point out to man, hey, man, you can't save yourself. So you need to depend on me and let me make that covenant real to you. If you'll have faith in me, I will take care of you. How many here remember the story of the Good Samaritan? What did you get out of it when you were a kid? Oh, be kind to your neighbors. The Good Samaritan is all about Jesus coming and redeeming mankind. It says there was a man that went from Jerusalem to Jericho, Adam, and he fell among the Thebes, stripped him, uh, wounded him, leaving him half dead. That's the curse of the law, poverty, sickness, and spiritual death. And so he's laying on the road all beat up. That's fallen man. And it says a certain Samaritan came to where he was. Now, we know that the priest could not do anything about the man that was all broken up. The law couldn't do anything. And that the Levitical priesthood couldn't do anything. Celebrations and all the flag waving couldn't heal the man. But a certain Samaritan, Jesus, came to where man was, was born as a man, lived as a man, at all points tempted like us. He bound up his wounds, pouring in oil, new birth, and wine, Holy Spirit, and put him in his own New Testament and said to the innkeeper, hey, Holy Spirit, you keep man, work with man, and when I come again, if there's any more debt, I will pay you all. Now, the good Samaritan is Jesus. Remember the question was, who is my neighbor that I'm to love to have eternal life? Remember the lawyer asked him? Well, the one you need to love who's your neighbor to have eternal life is Jesus. And when you love him, he'll work in you to be kind to others because you won't be able to be kind by yourself. There's people who just will get to you. Amen. I know I'm one of them. No. <laughs> All right, you still, purpose of Pentecost was to equip you, to give you something that Satan couldn't fight against. Day of Pentecost, a new kingdom. Everyone say new kingdom came. It's a temporal kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is temporal, while the kingdom of God is eternal. What do you mean? It just came for a short time to give us what we need to deal with the devil as long as we are here. The key is, is the devil's keeping us ignorant of who we really are and how to utilize the supernatural. Can you say amen? He's made us religious instead. A couple points I want to give you. 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, the day of Pentecost came, a new kingdom. The Holy Spirit filled the earth like never before. Men's hearts were born again. God imparted gifts and callings to the church. Do you know what the church is called, folks? It's called ecclesia. Ecclesia means you're the called out ones. You call out of darkness into light. You're the church. You're called out of bondage into freedom. You're called out of 
the world into the kingdom of heaven. Woohoo! But you got to start walking like that. And many Christians today don't walk like that. They walk like they're ignorant. There's a famine in the land. They hear, oh, yeah, I'm not putting my eyes on myself, and they'll fight you. <laughs> get your eyes up yourself. <laughs> and then they get it mad because you pointed out to them. Look, I'm trying to get you where you need to be. I don't want to argue. If you want to stay miserable, just go ahead. But I don't want you that way. Hello? Remember that little spoiled kid that threw himself down and has a tantrum? What did mom do? <laughs> yeah, amen. Well, listen, God is not like a mom in the earth. He'll just let you babble, blah, 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 and just go through your deal, and then he'll say, are you done? Oh, yes. He says, okay, let's get up and let's do it right. No condemnation, no making you feel bad. That comes from you and the devil. What are you saying, Pastor Kerry? I'm saying you're a child of God now. Start living like one. Hello? you got Almighty God living on the inside of you. Don't forget. Now, that doesn't run, run around, stretch or stop. No, you just go everywhere you go. A miracle happens because you carry the miracle worker. You carry an infectious disease called a gospel, where people take the gospel like a pill and it heals all their flesh. Are you still with me? Listen to this. Luke 24 says, when you go to Jerusalem, wait for the promise of the Father, which he saith that you will be endued from power from on high. So go with me to Acts chapter 2 now, and we'll finish up with you. The day of Pentecost, the ingathering of the harvest. Now, folks, I'm going to blow your mind. How many has ever heard that the day of Pentecost, that 120 disciples were in the upper room? How many has ever heard that? No upper room. They were in a higher part of a court. Some people would call it an upper room, but actually it was like a bleachers in a court area. So when they talked and they got filled with the Holy Ghost and the fire danced on them, everybody in the world could hear them. Because if you've ever been out in a, in a courtyard, you clap your hands and you speak in a court, people, you can hear people. Hello? And all of a sudden come a sound from heaven. What was it? This doesn't happen when you get filled with the Holy Spirit. But it came at that time. Why? Because none like ever before the Holy Spirit entered the earth without limitation. That means that when the Holy Spirit came into the earth, Satan lost his control over the church. So if you read the story, on the first, after Pentecost, chapter 3, I'm going to have to move real quick. I don't want to stay too long. After chapter, when chapter 3 happened, right after Pentecost, Peter was preaching, 3,000 people came to the Lord. First Pentecost, how many lost their life? 3,000 at the calf. And here, Peter, right after the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the power of God got on him, he said, men and brethren, let me tell you what just happened. These men not be drunk, what do you think? It being at 9 o'clock in the morning. These men be filled with the Spirit, that which is promised from Joel, where the Spirit of the Lord shall be upon them. Amen? And people that were around heard these fishermen that were used to cussing the fly, fly paper off the wall, speak in all these different languages, all these different people hearing their own language coming out of the mouth of fishermen, telling them about the wonderful works and power of God. Day of Pentecost, what happened? Holy Spirit came like never before and is looking for you and I to partner up with him. Forgiveness came. God says, I'm not holding the world's sin against them anymore. I'm holding judgment against the devil and those that listen to him. But as far as I'm concerned, you're all forgiven. Just come to me. 
I can't come to you because I'm guilty of this and this and this. No, God says, just come to me. I'll clean you up. I'll make you into a champion. You just got to trust me. Not only at the day of Pentecost, but the church was born. We are the called out ones, specially anointed by God to be different than the world. Today, there's a deception going on, I'm going to tell you, where the church is looking more and more like the world, folks. Loud music and all kinds of Greek things. And people go in, but they lack understanding of who God is. They get the goosebumps and the thrills of being excited. I get that at a, at a circus. And I'm not putting these things down. I'm just telling you, you got to get in the word. You got to get deep in with God so God can instruct you personally. You personally. Not generally through a pastor, but you personally. Folks, it works this way. You read your Bible, it gives you general guidance and direction. Say amen. But you got to get in with God to get the personal specifics by the Holy Spirit. That's why many Christians today, they don't know how to be led by the Spirit. They're just doing their old routine. They get up, they go through their routines. But what if the Spirit of God says, get in your car and go down the street about a block and a half? Can I tell you one testimony and then I'll leave you for the day? How many here are glad? People celebrate this day as the day of Pentecost. But folks, it's been so jumbled up, so we just took the time to share Pentecost with you. Some churches will embrace that this is Pentecost, others won't. Don't worry about that part. The part is you need to understand what it is. Can you say amen? I remember when I first was saved, I lived in South Prairie. Anybody know where South Prairie is? South Prairie had, at the time I moved down there, had all but about 90 people in the town. That's it on a good day, okay? I had just got saved. I lived in a four-bedroom little house in South Prairie for $75 a month. Remember it? That's where you and I, we help raise you and all. Hey, Amen. It's amazing how God works. And then I get saved. Now, you've got to realize I'm a hippie. I grow pot. I do bongs. And then Jesus saves me. I'm gloriously saved. The pot goes, the bong goes, everything is going. Hallelujah, it's great. And I went on my first fast. Everybody, how many's ever been on a fast? I went on, you see, the whole idea about your Christianity is you get up with God and you say, God, it's you and I. It's going to be an exciting day. And you enter your day that way. So I said, Lord, I'm going to fast. So I was literally about five days into a fast. And at this time, I had, uh, you know, I can't go into too much detail. And the individual that I was with was cooking steak while I'm fasting. On purpose to irritate me. I knew. And so I'm fasting everything. And, and I, man, it was just as if God was going to step in my bedroom. Man, I felt so humble and, and so overwhelmed by the presence of God. I think Wow, what's going to happen, God? And you know what he says to me? You're going to laugh. He says, you see your bike there? I says, yeah, get on it and go for a ride. <laughs> I'm ready for God to part the Red Sea, and God says, get on a bike. So this is a wonderful thing. So I pull the bike out because I'm going to keep it outside. I, I put it, I get it off my back porch. I just get on it right outside of the, the uh, hedges. And there was a crowd of people around this woman who was having a heart attack. Now, you got to be led by the Spirit, so I don't know what's going on. I'm on a bike ride for God. Can you say amen? <laughs> I didn't get more than three pedals, and God says, get off your bike. I got off my bike, walked over there, and, and here's what happened. Suddenly, it was like the Lord came on me. It was just like boom. And I walked into the crowd of people. They didn't know me from Adam other than I'm the neighbor hippie guy. And I walked in and I said, what seems to be the problem? And before they could answer, I said, God's healing you now. And I said to the woman, God's, I, that's God speaking to me. I didn't think it up. God's healing you now. And I says, all of you people go into the house, get everything ready for when she's totally healed, she's going to come in. I had to get rid of all that unbelief. Here's all these assembly of God people and spirit-filled people all going, you're going to die. What are we going to do? We're going to call the ambulance. And they're all freaked out. 
God had me come right over, calm them all down, send them all away. Jesus put them out, remember? And I just prayed for her. She got gloriously healed, became a very close neighbor friend. Then God moved me away. And you say, well, how do things happen like that? Because when you get up with God, every day is an adventure. Every day, miracles can happen. Stop limiting the God who lives in you by your old ways of doing things. Ask God to teach you, change you, alter you. He does it perfectly so that you can grow up into him and people can see that your life has actually changed. You know what happened to me? All my friends who knew me, my grasshopper friends, grass is gone, they hop somewhere else. And the booze was gone. My mom used to make moonshine. And you know, when you're serving the Lord, only your true friends will hang around. And after all the things I've been through and everything I've been through, God remains faithful, and you'll have a few friends that will remain faithful. Isn't that sweet? But listen, eyes off the world, because coming now is going to be a huge deception. We call it Lucifer's in game. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? I mean, while the church goes up, Satan is going to show up literally on the lawn. Okay? That's the hour we're living in. Hello? Don't be so surprised. Folks, our government just admitted there's UFOs. Our government said for years and years they've been lying to us because they don't know what they are. Well, I can tell you what they are. The Bible says what they are. They're demons. They're part of the Luciferian group that fell a long time ago. They've been hiding out and messing with humans for hundreds and thousands of years. Not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds and thousands. Hello? Who do you think messes with you? You got a few little assignment things uh, assigned to you. And so if you know that they're trying to be assigned to you, don't give them anything to work with. Hello? Kick him in the booty. How do you do that? Meet with God first thing in the day. Get in there, let the kingdom come on you, let all the things operate in you. And when you get up, you're not getting up in your strength. You're getting up in his. If you got something out of that this morning, we give the Lord praise. <laughs> We've been lied to, even in Christianity, that God saved you, but, mm, you know, he left a few things undone. So what do we think? When something goes wrong immediately, God's punishing us, or this is happening, hello, Satan's a liar. So, hey, let's train you. Let's get you to walk the way God wants you to walk. Let's get miracles happening, manifested in your life, and let's get your eyes off the world, off of others, and off of yourself, and succeed for Jesus. Can you say amen?